I am Loïc Dechary, speaking on behalf of the Biceps Project and how uh, Fight for Fire was uh, used for benchmarking um, in this context. So the, um, the Biceps Project is uh, uh, focused on storing hundreds of billions of very small objects in an efficient way. And this is the abstract goal, but the concrete goal is in the context of the Software Heritage Project, which is run at um, a foundation hosted by INREA. And its goal is very simple. It's to collect all the software that exists in source form in the internet, all the free software, uh, software that will eventually be free when copyright runs out, and uh, store it so that it is not lost. Uh, in order to do that, y you end up very quickly with tens of billions of files, and that's where they are at now, but it will quickly become 100 billion and more. So there needs to be a way for uh, an API that allows them to efficiently uh, store and retrieve these hundreds of billions of objects which is challenging because um, then uh, they, they would need also, because they are researcher, they would need to uh, do some, uh, some processing on that uh, in bulk. Uh, but with the latency imposed with every request to get one object, it quickly becomes uh, very, very uh, long just because of the latency. And uh, in addition, they, if they want to preserve uh, all these assets, they also need to be able to mirror them because uh, it's only by sharing the corpus of data that they will be able to make sure that um, it can sustain uh, catastrophic events uh, should the data center disappear, for instance. And uh, also they are on a budget because um, it's a research um, center, state-funded mostly, and uh, money is an issue. So uh, you need to use as little resources as possible. That was another uh, issue to address. So uh, in order to uh, design such a system, we, uh, which we did, uh, we came up uh, with uh, our theory, um, we'll say, well, we could do it this way, and I will come back to that later. Uh, but we had to verify uh, a number of assumptions and potential problems when actually implementing uh, this uh, object storage design. And uh, the four main problems were uh, inter-process or inter-thread log contention. So I'm speaking about the object storage. So for instance, when you, uh, you try to have many, many processes, trying to access the object storage, maybe they will get in the way of each other. And this is even true for when they try to access a database, a regular database. Uh, the second problem is space simplification, because when you have very, uh, very large number of very small objects, because the source file is typically three kilobytes to four kilobytes big, then uh, the space that is actually used to store it uh, may be uh, twice the size of the object. So to store one petabyte of data, you need to buy two petabytes of storage, which is very expensive. And there may be something to gain there. And then uh, there is the failure to scale out. So the problem with uh, an ever expanding storage, which the um, uh, source files of all humanity is, uh, it, will <laughs> it will never stop, there will be always be more, then you need something that scales out always. Uh, you cannot afford to have uh, a single table in a database with uh, hundreds of billions of objects because that's not going to work. In 2022, the limit is more or less tens of billions of uh, objects in a table. That works, but not hundreds of billions. Last but not least, it's the fact that uh, if you have a lot of programs harvesting the net to collect so, uh, 
source files. They will try to write and read from the object storage at the same time. And there, uh, there is no object storage at the moment that seems to provide a guarantee that they will not hurt the performances of the cluster as a whole when they try to do that as fast as possible. So they have to, to somehow, uh, maybe, uh, cooperate in order to throttle the, uh, themselves down to not hurt, not hurt the performances. So in, in order to, <coughs> to set up the experiment, uh, we had two choices. Either we could first implement, uh, write an implementation of the design of the object storage, or, uh, but that, that might take time because it has to be tested and, well, you know, the, the developing things is uh, always paying attention to a lot of details. But if you do that before verifying by, at scale, that your assumptions are correct, then you may end up having implemented something that has just the wrong architecture and that does not work. So instead, we wrote uh, fake uh, software that more or less behaves like it should in the end, but is not the real thing. So it was much faster to do that. But we ended up um, having the same building blocks, which you see on this slide. So on, uh, on the left, the right storage, uh, it's always contained. That's part of the design. You have, um, when you write, you only write at a given speed and it does not need to scale out. So you can use a Postgres database. That is perfectly fine. So we had that. And then uh, on the read side, which is where the things, uh, the sources from the past uh, of humanity are stored, they, they do not move. It's history. You do not rewrite history. So it's read-only, ever-growing, and there you need scale-out. And there is a Ceph cluster. And in the middle, uh, you have something that uh, splits uh, all the requests for read and writes uh, between the two, uh, depending on where the objects are. So we had this uh, software set up and we run the experiments in order to get uh, results. And the results we wanted to get were uh, not very complicated. They were actually uh, very simple. There are five of them. Uh, first, we wanted the byte throughput, the global byte throughput of the storage cluster for reads and writes. And we had very limited ambitions. 100 megabyte per second was enough. Uh, this is not much if you think about uh, networking. But if you think about harvesting uh, software, it's uh, an end-to-end measurement of the performances. It's a little bit more of a challenge. So for instance, if you have erasure coding in play, it means that whenever you write uh, 100 bytes, it will be split uh, in, let's say, six parts, written on six machines. So you add up all these latencies, all these delays, all these post potential accidents, then you have to get that back and co uh, coalesce them together and give it back to the client. This is where uh, we wanted to make sure that with all that included, we could still reach this benchmark. Byte per second were just two measurement, reads and writes. And then we had also the object per second um, because, uh, the, uh, because of the small objects, we wanted uh, to reach uh, a given level of object per second, which is 3,000 object per second uh, at the minimum and uh, in read and in writes. Last uh, but not least, we wanted to make sure that the latency for reads was low. That is uh, around 100 uh, milliseconds f uh, for 99% of the time. And the reason why we wanted that uh, is because when you have a, a web interface that accesses this object cluster, 
in order to display a source file for someone to read, you are uh, facing a human and there is no way it, this human being can wait two seconds to see the result of something. So it would be fine for batch processing to have long latencies, who cares? But for a human being, it's not acceptable. So we had this fifth measure measurement also. During the experiments, we uh, matched the results uh, by iterating over the implementation, the fake implementation of the design. And we learned a few things. First, uh, by repeating these benchmarks, we realized that uh, it will not end when we are satisfied with the results of with these uh, current implementation and this current hardware. It will have to be repeated whenever the hardware changes to make sure that the performance do not degrade. It will also have to be repeated whenever the, um, the software changes. Uh, so uh, we uh, designed it uh, in this way and because the GRID 5000 uh, tooling is more expensive in terms of human manipulation to use than the GFED uh, client, we ended up using uh, the GFED client uh, to help with that aspect. The, the way we, we did that uh, is simply, uh, so it's not fully automated, but you have to think that this happens on rare occasions only. So it has to be automated, it has to be easy to repeat, but uh, having some level of human intervention is probably uh, acceptable. And uh, the human being, the developer or the system administrator uh, only has two things, uh, three things to do. They run the Jeffet uh, client, uh, starts the experiment, downloads the zip file that contains the credentials, then configures all the hardware that was provisioned by Jeffed using Ansible, completely automated, and then it runs the experiment using a tool that is Tox, which will uh, speak to people who develop in Python and will seem bizarre because Tox is typically used for testing only. And so what, what we did, which is rather atypical, is to aggregate testing with benchmarking. And the ambition uh, or the, the ultimate goal is that maybe one day it could be fully automated and part of a continuous integration. So whenever the software changes, it can be tested for performances without human intervention and that would be done by Tox. The business impact for uh, Easter eggs, which is a small 20-person company, is that uh, it allowed us to verify the performances of a theoretical solution, uh, which would have not been able, uh, uh, would not have been possible uh, otherwise. And it demonstrated that we could go on with the implementation uh, of the, the actual implementation of the uh, um, design because the behavior at scale was uh, more or less okay. The assumptions were uh, good enough. And more importantly, uh, it's not just Easter eggs. It's also uh, the Software Heritage Foundation, uh, which is an independent entity. They also want to reproduce these results themselves. And that's also an output of the experiment. Easter Eggs is a very small company and there, there was no way, uh, we, we could not afford uh, the platform that were uh, available through Fed for Fire. It's much too expensive. So we, we could have gone the way uh, that usually software implementer with no big means have, which is release the software, wait for someone with a bigger use case to uh, try it, maybe run into problems and wait for feedback and address them. That would be a very, very long development cycle that works. But here we were, uh, thanks to Fed for Fire, we were able to shorten 
uh, considerably this development cycle and I believe that in the end it leads to more reliable software. Um, what we take out of um, Fatful Fire is essentially uh, a given automation level and also I think it is uh, kind of future proof because uh, it uh, for instance, uh, to, to give an example, if someone who does not have access to Grid 5000 uh, but to another um, cluster that is part of Fed for Fire wants to try BSEPs for themselves, then they will be able to do so because Fed for Fire is, uh, gives a level of portability to the methods that we implemented and document to test uh, BSEPs. And that's it. Thank you.